Good evening, everybody. Miss the Q. Hey, guess what? Due to the fact that uh, my services are going to be needed in about an hour and 20 minutes, we don't have that much time this evening. There's been some events that require my, uh, what I've trained for, let's put it that way. And so due to some developing happenings, my services are going to be required in about an hour and 20 minutes. That gives us time to discuss a few things. Now, last night, I wanted to continue in the book of Revelation, and somehow I was steered off course. I don't know how that happened. But we were discussing, we're going to start here tonight at Revelation uh, 15. Hopefully we can squeeze this, right, squeeze this in an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, I do regret that I have to leave, but who knows, uh, I could leave and pop right back, so I don't know yet. And if so, we will continue, but as of right now, um, my services are going to be required here very soon. All right, so if we can begin, Revelation 15, and because we couldn't cover it last night, we had just finished with Revelation 14. Prior to starting Revelation 15, I want to read something to you. Can I read this to you? Because we're dealing, as, you, as we go through the book of Revelation, we're also dealing with identity. We're about to go into some spiritual things. And if you think we're going to be done with the Revelation study, all the way to our reading of, of, of 2022, you're wrong. And because these, this is the book of Revelation we're reading, and now we have to go back and contextualize everything based upon the other writings in the Old Testament. This is where we do the comparisons. Right after we're done with this, this is where you begin to see certain things you have not seen before. Because I certainly have not heard anybody ever talk about them. Now, please, don't ever think that somehow I'm coming up with these ideas or anything else. No, that's not it. Things are revealed as the Spirit reveals them. See, if I reveal something out of me, it is uh, stupid. But if the Spirit reveals something, it is eternal. Anything the Spirit reveals is in line with the Word of God, never contradictory. Anything that the Spirit reveals is absolute truth. There's, there's no fallacy in it. Anything that the Spirit reveals will penetrate the hearts and minds of those listening. It will confer with your spirit. If the Spirit gives me something, that means it rests within you. The Spirit will never give me anything that's not within you. And why? Because you have to confirm everything that I say. Which leads me back to Thessalonians. So that we can understand this precept. I'm going to read something in Thessalonians chapter 2. 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification and of the spirit and belief of the truth. You know what that means? There is no new thing to be told by anybody and anybody who says so is lying because the truth has to be given to all of us or I would speak a different language that you don't understand. <clears throat> In order for you to say yes that is truth you must already know the truth. Now do you see, the Spirit does not reveal something to a person he has not revealed to the entire body. The Holy Spirit does not work in a secret closet, nor give things in secret, but conveys the same thing to the entire body of Christ, and the ones he's called to tell of a thing. It confirms within your spirit, never your flesh. In fact, because the Spirit is truth, it is against your flesh, so that most things you hear of the Spirit give no comfort to your flesh, but give you absolute victory and freedom of the Spirit. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. You know when Jesus said, you're in this world, not of this world, your spirit has been sanctified. That's a heavy statement. No wonder you did not fit in. No wonder you found things incomplete throughout your life. No wonder 
You look through the scriptures and you do not like the explanations that you hear coming from the mouths of men. No wonder. Somebody can think they tell you the truth, yet you find yourself searching anyway. No wonder you are a peculiar people. No wonder you don't fit in. Most importantly, you believe the truth. See, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. His voice is the voice of truth. You already know his voice. Internally. A lie does not settle with you. Now your flesh, on the other hand, likes a lie. It makes the flesh comfortable. See, your flesh wants to hear things like, oh, you're okay, just keep going. That's what your flesh wants to hear, right? But your spirit says, no, no. Don't listen to that flesh, the castle walls, that's foolishness. Your spirit says, I need more spiritual food not the comfort of the flesh. And when you really begin to mature, you seek no comfort of the flesh, nor do you desire a break. It's funny, in the scriptures, Jesus said that uh, all those who are uh, laden, heavy laden, right? All those who are tired and everything else, that he would give rest, we took that wrong. When he said that, it means this, to find Christ is to go beyond the flesh. Does the spirit seek rest? Hmm? The flesh gets tired. Your spirit is always willing, being sanctified from the beginning. Your spirit derives its essence from the throne. The throne is never tired. The flesh gets tired. To rest is to be back with Christ. That is a place of rest. That's a place of surety and completeness. To be wearied is to never find the place you belong. People have taken this physically, saying, well, if you're tired in the flesh, just get some rest. You know, the Lord said, you know, everybody, no, 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 no. Who's going to go beyond their flesh and stop giving excuses to it? Do you not know your castle walls stand there? And if they could talk, they always complain. Your flesh has aches and pains that you've forgotten about. More than likely, your hair hurts. How about that one? Every time you come comb, brush, cut your hair, it could be complaining if it had power to complain. But you're running the show. If you look at your castle walls and say, boy, are they dirty... Are they just old? And then you begin to feel old. Now, wouldn't this be funny? You're inside of a castle, not connected to it. You just simply dwell there. But because the castle walls are worn and tired, you then say, I'm tired. No, you're not. The castle walls are. I find it amazing anyway. People say I'm tired. Then they start dreaming. And they're so active in their dreams. They're so inspired by many dreams. Your life changes based upon dreams in a lot of ways. Yes, your flesh is going to get tired. Let the redeemed say, so what? Your flesh is here to serve you. You're not here to serve your flesh. You have been chosen to salvation from the beginning. You were sent here on earth to be saved. That's an awesome statement. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification. That is a type of purification. He has chosen you to salvation through sanctification. Your life has been the process of sanctification. It's not a mistake. Nothing is unfair that's happened in your life. Everything was purposed. And those who came against you, they will surely be punished. Why? Because the same one, Paul, who wrote this, also said this, and he had understanding. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. 
I have to stop there. To be admired in all of them that believe, not some of them that believe, not just a few of them that believe, but to be admired in all them, in all them that believe. That means when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a partaker in the coming of Christ. You can die today. You're still going to be a partaker. You'll be raised in the end just like Jesus said. He'll raise you up at the end. He will not lose you. He won't. Then if you back up, it says, saying it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Well, what's he talking about? Well, then, let's read the whole thing. Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm starting at 3. We are bound to give thank always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Now I want to point out something for all those who minister to other people. It says, we are bound to give thanks, to thank God always for you, brethren, naming who they're giving thanks to, as it is meet. What's meet? It is meat, it is good, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. That is the beauty of the entire thing. You folks that minister to other people. You can only see this way if you truly love those you speak to. That means they're prospering. Spiritual prosperity. They're prospering, they're increasing, they're growing, they're, ex they're, they're growing by leaps and bounds. That means your efforts are not in vain, but most importantly, they can function in this world. You see, there's nothing more harmful to the mind of a human being than to see a baby first start walking and they walk near a set of steps. Or they walk near something where they could fall. For the one who spent the time to teach them to walk, that can be a very scary time. But it really adds confidence to a parent when they see their child turn away from the steps, turn away from those areas of danger. Does it not bring relief? And you're like, yes. They saw that obstacle and turned. It makes a teacher happy, doesn't it? Well, you're walking. You're learning how to walk. You're now walking away from obstacles that once captured you. You're doing this by faith. Those pitfalls and cliffs you can't see with your eye. But you're being led of the Spirit. And through a multitude of trials and tribulations, you are learning and you are walking. It is impossible to please God without faith, therefore, because you use faith to walk your life. It is pleasing unto the Father. It is. <clears throat> so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. There's also another moment when a father looks at his children and yet they still persevere despite the bullying in school, despite the unfairness of other students, and despite any handicap of the child, the child still continues to endure. In fact, if you were on a road and you were looking at a guy who was desperately trying to change his tire, but he did not ask for help, you would be drawn to help that individual. Do you know why? Because you're visually seeing him exhaust everything that he can do to change that tire. You would want to help him. But if you saw a guy on the side of the road trying to change his tire and he throws a tire down and starts flagging down everybody, you're going to go right past him. Why? Because you see him not doing everything that he can do. You're seeing him not exhaust everything he knows how to do. He gave up. See, when you see someone give up, you're, li you're liable to pass that individual. And when you know it, that when you give up and throw your hands down, guess what happens? You become impatient. You start demanding things. For the one who continues to try and try and
and try and try. You already know that sooner or later they're going to get it, so why not help them? Why not help them? You see how that works. That's what the servants of the kingdom do for you. When you have done all of what you can do, servants are dispatched to help you. Hmm. It continues and says, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer just to bring to your attention. Why do you suffer? You're suffering for the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God are all the precepts and principles and the ways of our established Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is to eat of his flesh, to let his flesh become a part of you. Well, in the flesh he won't this life, preaching the word of God and suffering for it. Take up your cross and bear it. Your passers by, this is not your home. You're born, you walk, you grow, and you leave. You're here to assist and grow. You were called to salvation. Is that not a promise of promises? Most people look for the promises. They want to know, well, are all the troubles going to go away? No. Stop telling them that. Tell them the truth. You're passers-by. You were on your walk. You walk into a city. They can't get it together. And you begin to assist as the Lord leads, because you know you're leaving. See, when you stop at a store on a road trip, right, and somebody needs help <clears throat> or a problem exists, well, the first thing, because you know you're leaving, you're, you're not attached. So then you're focused on actually helping. It has nothing to do with reputation or anything else because you know those people are not going to see you again and therefore you render a true help because you're a passersby. But if you're a part of that town, you begin to co-mingle with the people and you build something called a reputation which stops you from absolute servitude in the kingdom because now you have to set and protect your reputation, which means you have to befriend certain people and disassociate yourself with others. But a passers-by does not worry about disassociation, nor about associating themselves with anyone. They render help as they see help is needed. And anyone who asks for help, they will render. Why? Because they know they have to leave. They know they have to leave. If you walked into a crumbling town and you saw it falling apart, would you not go in there and render help to get people out? to teach people how to walk out of that place onto the road that you're on. This is your life. You were never meant to make this your paradise. This is why a lot of people can no longer accept. They can't accept revelation because they have truly made this place their paradise. Their joy is held within this world. They have no joy spiritually. They have replaced the Holy Spirit with instant gratification of things they can purchase with their money and therefore they want more and more money. They're buying their happiness. Their identity has become their substance. And when their substance is removed, they have no identity. And this is why millionaires commit suicide all the time. Because if they ever file bankruptcy, they have no more identity. And without an identity, they say, what's the point of life? You see, their true point of life was to obtain their happiness, their joy, to fulfill themselves. We don't live that way. Our, fulfill our fulfillment is in the Father. It's in Christ. It says, it says, which is manifest token of righteous judgment of God, that he may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which he also suffers, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. The Lord will. Repay those who trouble you as long as you're in right standing with him. So you should never contemplate that. You know, over and over again you hear this and some people say, yes, God's going to pay him back. You shouldn't think that way. You should say, yes, that's none of my concern. Let me walk forward with the things of God. It is God's business. 
whom he does. But while I am here, I'm going to do my part to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, that that number may be minimized. You see, a lot of people are, are they're, they're concerned about who's going to fall. How about this? A true occupant of the kingdom is concerned about who they can reach. And they're saying, Lord, empower me to reach them. The only power they seek is the power to communicate the truth. The truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. To someone who does not know it. That's the power they seek. Kind of like Solomon, huh? Left with a kingdom. About to rule the kingdom. And he said, I don't know how to rule these people. I need your wisdom, Lord. And the Lord granted that to Solomon. He had enemies too. But he saw the truth of the situation. And that's why he was granted wisdom. The truth of the situation is this. If you ask the Father for something. And you recognize him by asking. Then you should ask him things according to his will. Which is this. You know what his plan is. Because he sent his son. So why would you ask for something outside of his will. You know what he's doing. You know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going out to the four quarters of the earth. So step in his will and follow Christ and say, Lord, give me what I need to reach them. Give me what I need to reach them. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. My concern is for those who potentially could fall away and those who are in a fallen state. My greatest concern is not for those who are within the body of Christ who are family. The greatest concern goes for those who are in the most danger. Those in the body of Christ are not necessarily everybody you talk to either in the body of Christ. Even some of those are in danger. It's the ones that don't know the Father. You can tell when a person does not know Christ because they don't do those things that Christ said to do. If you know Christ, how can you not do those things he said to do? Because when you know him, you desire to serve in a kingdom capacity. And guess what? Your brothers and your sisters become the object of your life. They become the object and everything else becomes tools to get to them. That's when you step through the fire to get them. That's when you walk above water to get to them. You know what? One of the examples of Jesus walking on the water and the disciple not having the faith to do so, he took his eyes off Christ. Yes, but guess what? What was his motivation for walking on the water? To see if he could do it. You need to ask yourself, what was his motivation? He said, Lord, if you bid me to come, I'll, you know, I'll just come over there. That's not good motivation. Some of you have done that in your life. Lord, if you tell me, I'll just go do it. Yeah, but you, what was your motivation? You know what the difference is between thoroughness and a simple demonstration? Here's thoroughness. Thoroughness is when you see your brother, the impossible scenario, the one that's impossible. Normally, the ones in your family that get on your nerves are those impossible people, the ones that absolutely will not hear you. And so the one who has a purpose of the kingdom will say, Lord, give me what I need to reach that person that just cursed me out. Give me the strength and the right words to reach that one that just stabbed me six times in the back. Give me the words to speak to the one, the truth, and to demonstrate the one who tried to murder me when I was young. See, once you break away from the flesh, you no longer operate by those things of the flesh. And when you do that, you become a kingdom citizen. And nothing holds you back. Nothing. What power can grant that to a person? Our Father in heaven. And that is the proof of servitude. Likewise, the proof of the flesh is when we say, I can't do it because only the flesh would tell a person they can't do it when Jesus said you could see if the Lord sends you somewhere you can do it 
if the Lord does not send you to a place, you shouldn't go in the first place. Normally, people send themselves, and then they say, I can't do it, because they assign themselves their own mission. But when the Lord sends you, he has qualified you to complete it. He is the author and finisher of your faith. It is him who completes the work in you. He is the established power. And through him, we may enter back into the kingdom and find the kingdom. Do you see it's never been our power? It's always been his. To walk, to follow Christ, is to walk in his steps, is to walk in the will of God. Jesus, in fact, is the will of God. To follow him is to walk within the will of God. Huh. And how did he walk? To be a partaker of his flesh and of his blood means you have to die to self like he did in the flesh. That you may be quickened. Because only those who perish of this flesh may be quickened. You cannot be quickened unless your flesh is dead. In other words, you must die to self completely. Do you guys know we're running out of time? It's happening. You know, I wanted to come back on this afternoon to tell you guys something very simple. It is happening. It's happening. Certain things that many have been showed years ago, they're taking place right now. Things are happening. How many of you, how many of you here have been shown things by the Father and they're just now happening? You can't even identify what's happening. But the timing is here and you know it. I'm talking about the timing of distress for the world. I will not be distressed because the Lord is my strength. He truly is my shepherd and I shall not want for anything because he is my shepherd. The world will be distressed, not me. I never really face distress because I do not wish nor plant seeds of distress upon another. I don't take, but I always give in any time of trouble. Someone has always provided, and they don't even know why or how. Therefore, I do not worry. I'm one of those who will put the Lord's word to the test, and guess what? If it didn't work, and it's just going to kill me. But either way, I'm going to stand there. If the Lord told me to stand under a falling anvil, and he wrote that to me, then guess what? I'm going to go stand under that fallen anvil. If he does not perform, that's not up to me. That's up to him. But guess what? He has never failed to perform exactly what he wrote. We have only failed to follow it through. We don't follow it through, and that's why we have no faith. You know what we say? Well, it looks like it's not working. I might as well try something else. Well, how are you going to know the delivering hand of God if you don't have patience? How would you know that? I just take things a step further and say, well, the Lord gave me instruction, no further instruction, so I shall wait upon the Lord. And sure enough, my strength is renewed in doing so. Sure enough, he begins to open my eyes concerning many situations. And it's also a shield away from enemies. One thing I know about patience is that your enemies can no longer touch you when you stand in patience. And many people don't even know that. That very moment where you have exhausted everything you know how to do and you can't do anymore, when you stand still, your enemies are effectively cut off. And if they poke their little fingers in there, they're going to be missing some fingers. That becomes a time of meditation. The time you have to wait. Because a big begins to become a time of growth and meditation. Miraculous things happen while you wait because you will see the delivering power of the Lord work. Many people won't wait to see it. They're impatient. And they say, well, I just don't know if God will do it because you've never, you've never stood still to see the end of the matter. I don't know about you, but I know something about the Lord's working in these trials and tribulations, and it is this. He has never in my life shown up at the beginning. He has absolutely never showed up in the middle. He didn't come at three quarters of the way. 
He came at the last minute of the last hour of the last day. And he has never failed to deliver me. And he gave me a message over the course of my life, and it is this. If you know I'm coming at the end of a matter, why would you worry at the beginning of a matter? If you know I'm coming at the last hour, why do you continue to waste your time trying to solve your problems when you did not author the problem? You're not growing yourself. The Lord is growing me. See, he gave me that message. You just sit still and meditate upon my word. You learn in your trials. It is your school moment. And so guess what? In horrific situations, when everything looks hopeless and lost, I close my eyes to all the things around me. In other words, I, I refuse to see of the flesh. And the Lord opens my spiritual eyes. And he points me to scripture and says, did not say I would do this. And I see it in the, in the tribulation and trial. He says this over and over. I said I would do this and truly it's done. He even corrects me. He says, if you do this, I've already prophesied over your life. Because you did this, you're now here. But if you have patience, I will yet deliver you. You wait upon me, there's full deliverance. You also see him working situations outside of your situation you never saw the connection to. He doesn't just deliver you. He delivers everything around you. You're ambassadors to Christ. You're learning to trust him. Now, all this time, we have been taught to learn to trust the Lord. Something so very simple. How many have mastered that? How many? Your flesh will never agree to trust in the Lord. All of our flesh are whining. You know, the little bad children, right? You ever know? Have you ever known a bad children? child i'm not talking about one who has outbursts that's not i'm talking about the devious children that's our flesh the flesh that conspires and everything else that's your flesh we have learned not to operate by the flesh but who can stand here today and say yes i trust the lord because listen the day is coming if you don't trust him if you don't trust him you don't wish you had if you don't trust in your Lord, I'm telling you, 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 are, you, you could be vacuumed up by the false miracles of the Antichrist system. If you don't wait upon the Lord, you'll never be sensitive nor understand the process of the Lord. And if you don't do that, you're going to lose your faith in him. And if you lose your faith in him, you will turn away. You see, it's like this. If the Lord came to your house and you never saw him, but you heard a voice say, wait upon me. And that's all you heard, but you knew it was from the Lord. And then somebody else came to your house for $50,000. And they said, the Lord told me to give this to you to absolve you of all your problems. What would you do? Would you believe that person who says the Lord told them to do something? Or would you wait upon the Lord still? You know what I would do? You know what the average believer would do? The average believer would say, oh, thank you, God answered the prayer. Do you know why? Because it has to do with money. That's why. It's instant. And one thing I know about the Lord, he does not do these things instantly like that let me give you an example <clears throat> a lot of you have had chunks of money in your life haven't you did it do you good or did you find yourself back in the beginning again hmm? because remember any blessing from above is without regret it's everlasting so when you had that chunk of money what happened afterward? Did your problems come back? So I ask you, what this? What? Listen to me closely. It is the perception of things. Now a person can be commanded to give you something, 
But you were still supposed to wait upon the Lord before you did anything with the money you received. Isn't that something? Hmm? Isn't that something? If the Lord says wait, it doesn't matter what you receive. You still need instruction. Are you guys listening to me? So you don't fall into these traps. You still have to have instruction. I've held answers in my hands. And the Lord gave me no instruction. Guess what I did? I did nothing. And sure enough, had I done something, it would have been a disaster. I did nothing. I waited upon the Lord. This is what we must learn to do, to wait upon the Lord. Now, the flesh does not function like that. You know what the flesh does? Well, surely the Lord would want me to do this. We start compensating. Coming out with a language for the flesh is actually quite funny looking back on those moments. Right? Because then a person will say, oh, no, surely the Lord wants me to have this. And we snatch it. Oh, no, the Lord would have me do this, that, or the other. And he said, no such thing. Right? No such thing. None. So guess what's going to happen? Trouble in China is going to happen. All of us have to be broken. All of us do. You see, our true identity is about to be established, and what this means is this. Everything that defines you in the world is going to be taken away. If you are one of the ones who have overcome the defining objects in your house, you've lost interest already. But if those things in your house and in your life define you, they're going to be taken away. Do you know why? The Lord loves you, and it's an interference to your growth. It's an interference. That will happen very gracefully in your lives because you are believers. And every last one of you will be delivered. You see, it says this, when he shall come, Paul said, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. I think that's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Right? But let me tell you what, what, this, what this is saying, just, just in case you missed it. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. You know why Jesus is going to be glorified in his saints? And to be admired in all them that believe. You know why he's going to be glorified in his saints? Because if you belong to him, you're partakers of that spirit that's coming. You need to understand something. When he comes, life as we know it changes. I wish this was Wacky Wednesday and I had time to tell you about some of the rocks, some of the mountains you've seen that are not mountains, some of the valleys you see that are not valleys. You can take pictures of them and everything else. There's no way you can tell, but you can walk right through them. How about that? Hmm, that sound wacky? It's truthful. Imagine going to a place and walking right through a mountain, finding there was no mountain there in the first place. Isn't that something? Many of the professionals say it's a hologram of unknown origin. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. You know what it is simply? Simply, it's God's creation. Mankind, they, we have been the dodos saying we know all about God's creation. We do not. We think we know what's within the earth. We do not. We theorize everything. We don't know the truth. That's why science changes every single day. We thought gravity for a long time was the strongest force ever, didn't we? It is not. Electromagnetism is. We thought everything in the heavens was based on gravity, but it's not. It's based on electromagnetism. Strong forces. They try to explain it through mathematics, weak and strong forces, right? Gluons and all these things, they do explain. All things are held together by light. All things are held together by light. 
You are held together by light. What are the instructions that hold light together? They're trying to break those with CERN. They're trying to control the force that commands light to hold things together. Why do I say light holds things together? Because as far as they can see, this is public science, photons are responsible for holding atoms together, for holding the nucleus and the protons and electrons and everything else at their basic core together. That's light. Photon is a light packet with an immense amount of energy. They're trying to control it. Who commands it? Your Father in Heaven has set a command over it. Something beyond mathematics. Something beyond the quantum world. Something that it takes a quantum computer to solve because it cannot be solved by any computer on the face of this earth that does not tap in to a quantum matrix. And that is simply to say the computer would require so much power, storage and processing speed would be so immensely high. It cannot be done in this dimension. That's why they have quantum computers. Are they real? You better believe it. Are they intelligent? You better believe it. Do they have an answer before it's even asked? You better believe it. You're dealing with some type of dimensional science. What causes an entity to manifest and then not and, and then go away? When Gabriel and Michael, Uriel, Raphael and all those do what they do, who empower them to do that? Your Father in Heaven did. He controls the forces. If he sets a command and empowers something to do something, it can, because creation is his. They're trying to find out how to control small pieces of it. Even they have come to the conclusion that all of what we see is of an intelligent design. It did not evolve. Life is devolving, not evolving. Some of the life forms on the face of this earth have isolated genetics not found anywhere else but in that species. What does that tell you? That all things that are on this earth didn't come from this earth. That's kind of like the story of the fallen angels, right? People call them dinosaurs. Don't they? The bones are irradiated. They lie about the carbon dating. Carbon dating, right, is a lie. Let me tell you why it's a lie. Not only did they take a mammoth. Now, hear me out. They carbon date a mammoth, right? The leg on the mammoth, 10 billion years old. The other leg on the mammoth, 2,000 years old. The side portions in the ribcage come up with seven different dates. Carbon dating does not work at all. It's a scientific, it's a scientific estimation to fit this paradigm of evolution. Dinosaurs are not that old. Isn't that funny? But when you speak to people, you have to speak in the context of scientific things. They believe that the earth is four billion years old. See, the age of the earth, because it's not connected to my salvation, it didn't bother me either way. That's of the father, but carbon dating is a lie. Many prominent microbiologists believe that dinosaurs have been around up until about a hundred years before Christ. They know that dinosaurs walk this earth during the time of Christ in isolated regions. They also know that there's something strange with dinosaurs. See, they mixed up the bones and everything else and they make people believe it. But they will never tell you about the speech centers in these dinosaurs. How that they took a computer and replicated some of the uh, centers of voice for these things. Why in the world will they have any vocal regions whatsoever? Why? I'll tell you why. Because the dinosaurs were the hybrids. They were the hybrids. They were the mutations. Just like certain insects today are half plant, half insect, half something else. They're still running around. Hmm. 
There are so many unknowns in this world. And mankind thinks they mastered all of them, but they're only fooling the populace. They themselves are scared to death. And they'll never tell you the truth, but you're going to find out anyway. But those who believe in the Most High, these things should never be a mystery. You ought just believe in the Word of God. If you believe in the Word of God, you can move past it. Therefore, if you ever see one, you can say, Up, get behind me. If you don't belong to Yeshua HaMashiach, get behind me. Because you don't know what it is. That's one of my favorite sayings. Because who has the authority? Who has been placed in authority over all things? Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus of Nazareth. He has been placed in authority over all things. So it is by him all things are subject to. And if all things are subject to him, I need not know its origins. But I will try it every single time. And believe me, demons will screech when you try them that way. They screech. They snarl and growl. They run. Consequently, when you belong to the Lord, they hide from you. When you have made it up in your mind, I'm going to walk the will of my Father no matter what, they will run faster away from you. The last thing they want is to see you. Because you're the one running around because you have committed to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To be an ambassador to Christ, now you're carrying full authority. And you're deadly to them. Demons are afraid of hell. Those who commit their lives to Christ, demons don't come to their faces. Those who still have temptation in the flesh, they will try, but every time they try, just simply purge that temptation. And then they run even faster away from you. You see, the word says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And everything else is subject unto the authority of Christ. That's why Jesus said all things are subject, all things, all spirits are subject to you through his name all spirits why would you fear anything and when I say listen you know what that means that means if a person is being influenced by a spirit you can nullify that by your presence how many have been there before I have I have a demon may only recompense parts of you that it has. In other words, if you act out of anger, demons are already angry. That's part of their power. To exercise anger is a power of a demonic entity. To deceive is the power of a demonic entity. And so when you exercise these things, you give demons authorization to operate. But when you die to your flesh and you prepare yourselves to walk in the steps of the Lord, and you have cast away things out of your life. They run from you. And if you walk into somebody's home, it can become very silent. They don't want you there in the first place. Those of you who have given your life to Christ, in truth, always remember, Satan probes, and he will work through the weakest vessel around you. He probes. In a weak state, Satan will utilize anybody he can. He certainly utilized Peter. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Peter, of all people, Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. Peter, out of compassion, was told to move aside by Jesus of Nazareth. Peter was in a state of weakness. That's why the Lord told them to pray. He said, do you not know that Satan desires you? Why? Because they were following Christ. And I'm going to tell you, do you not know Satan desires you? In your moment, and listen, they were sleepy. He said, you can't stay awake with me? He was warning them. 
you can fall asleep if you want to. And Satan can potentially overtake you. So who put the excuse in the earth when it comes to servitude of Christ to ever be tired? I can see if you're working on the railroad. Yes, you may get tired of that, but we're speaking about spiritual. How can a person get tired of any spiritual thing? Only when you're losing does a person say, I'm tired. And anything connected with spirit. Look, I will never get tired of spiritual thing. I will fight. I told you. If I have one finger left, I'm going to take that little finger and scoot. Why? Because the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And if the flesh is so weak that only a finger can move, then that finger better do the job. This body houses me, the one speaking to you. This body is for servitude of me. This body does not sin of itself. But my soul has to agree to commit a sin. I can't blame anything on my life on anybody. And I have gone through things to be prepared to speak to you and to endure in a time that's here. You see, these we have stepped into some very confusing times. The cyber war has already begun. It began three years ago. A vicious cyber war. I, you know, for the life of me, I don't know why many people, many people should start speaking about the cyber war at hand. Everything you are has been compromised, taken, stolen. But they still want your money. Oh, they want your tax money until the end. Why? Because that is their control mechanism. Money, not ours. Going through this winter, many people are going to feel the crunch this winter. We're going to make it through this winter. Not everybody will. Not everybody's appointed to make it through this winter. Transitions will take place this winter. And it's time for you all to begin to take care of one another. This winter is going to be harsh and unstable. Speaking of the weather, it's going to be very dangerous in certain countries. ISIS and other terrorist organizations have vowed to strike the West in the coldest months they can find. They have vowed to do this. They have vowed to. That means gas. That means water. That means electrical. That means during any holiday. That means a type of paranoia is going to sweep the streets of America. So strong to the point that they will have to govern movements of everybody. The Internet is the first change under the guise of a cyber threat, which is taking its toll. Let me tell you what will make a cyber threat real. You've already had your password stolen. You've had your identity stolen and everything else. The next one is going to mess with the financial centers. They're going to have no choice but to change the currency. You're still going to have your money. You will have your money, but it's going to shake some people up. See, if you're not rich, you won't be affected much. If you have a lot of money, you're going to be affected. You'll be affected by a 0.01% change. Those who don't have millions and billions of dollars, you won't even miss it. You won't miss it. But to a rich guy, a penny means everything. Rich people forecast their finances over the course of years, and that's where they're going to see the loss. The system is going to change. But those who belong to the Lord will not be affected. But if you have access, well, let's just say this. Do the right thing with all things the Lord has blessed you with. Never fail to do that. Do the right thing. According to the Lord, according to the Holy Spirit, do the right thing. And that goes for all of us. That goes for me. It goes for you. It goes for Angela. That goes for everybody. Do the right thing from this point on. All these people have been collecting gold and silver. 
They're going to cry. It's metal. Do you not know all metal can be found and is already found? Nobody can store up metal without them knowing where it. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. I first heard some folks ill-advised saying, store up your treasure here or in this place and do it this. You can't do that. That is a mineral. Listen, here's the one thing nobody ever thought of. Is not gold and silver a mineral? Isn't it a mineral? It's a mineral, correct? Is that not a mineral? Is it a mineral or not? That's all you have to know. You just ponder that. It's a mineral. You just ponder that. See, while everybody's thinking about money and its trade value and things of that, they have forgotten it's a mineral. It's the middle of the earth. My goodness, if it came down to it, they could confiscate everybody's minerals. They don't need a new law for that. Do they? Hmm? No, they put icing all over the top of it. Nobody ever thinks these ways. Nobody's out there saying, oh, your silver and your gold are minerals. That's not what they're saying. They're not saying that. They're having everybody go get it. Here's what's happening. Everybody's buying up this stuff. They're storing it in certain locations of which those locations are known. But what they're doing is consolidating all the gold and silver into the hands of certain people in the public who can't afford it. And they know exactly where to go to get it. So, in fact, people are out there working as inventory clerks for somebody else. Don't you know when you design a satellite with optics, you have to have filters. See, when you detect things upon the surface of the earth, it's, it's not just your standard camera. Minerals reflect, and so you have to put filters in there. Certainly, if you want to look beneath the surface of the earth, you have to go through houses and concrete structures. Lots of steel, metal, gold, silver, uh, aluminum, nickel, all those things. And so you have to have filters. Well, when you design a digital filter based with the optics, you can also fine-tune it to pick up just nickel, just silver, just gold. And, and you can tell what type gold it is, 22 carat, 14 carat. It, it doesn't matter. And you can tell where it is. I'm telling you, we have satellites up there that can see all metallic substances and gases on the surface and inside the earth, and everybody's storing up gold and silver. Minerals. They're hoarding minerals of the... That would be like us going out and, and I say, Pastor Scott, we got to go find all the mica we can. All the mica we can. Let's go get it. Because we're going to need that in the future. But wouldn't that sound dumb? Or if I told Angela, Angela, we have to start collecting chalk. How's that? Is that better? Let's get all the chalk we can. Because we can barter with that. No, you can't. You're going to barter with chalk? Hmm? How foolish is that? That's why they're going to cast the gold and silver in the streets, because the paradigm of reality is going to shift. Gold and silver won't be worth anything. It will be a mineral, no good for anything. You can't eat it. I'm telling you now, if you can't eat it, it's going to be no good to you. You can't drink it, it's going to be no good to you. You won't be able to barter with a person who's dying of pestilence. Those who think they're going to live in the wilderness, they, what they might want to do is do a survey on animal behavior, because the animals are changing. Wild animals are becoming twice as aggressive. They're losing their fear of humanity. Within the course of another year and a half, things will escalate. My goodness. Mankind is setting themselves up to do one thing. You know what that is? Kill one another. They're not going to survive. They're going to destroy one another over dirt and chunks of steel. Just like the word of God says, they still did not repent of the works of their hand, nor of their thefts, nor of their fornications. They still worshipped those things they made with their own hands. Do you know the Lord said that? He said that, and that's exactly what mankind is going to. He said, 
The men that were not killed by the plagues of the fire, smoke, and brimstone that issued forth out of the mouths of those that were released at 200,000, right? That were prepared for an hour, an hour and a day and a month, or something like that. They did not, the rest of the people that were not killed by this, they did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, that they should not worship idols of gold and of silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. I can assure you that's our common day society. You know what mankind are doing? Sorceries. What is that? Sciences. Sciences connected with spiritual changes that take place within the people, and that's why they mess with frequencies, because they are manipulating biological, biological platforms, let's say, with sciences. They're not going to repent of that, nor of their murders. A lot of people, a lot of people are being murdered every single day simply by the system. They're not going to repent of that either, nor of their fornication. They did not turn back to God, but they accept everything but God, nor of their thefts. They have obtained things by the blood of many. They worship devils. You can't see a devil, nor can you name a devil a devil. And they worship them. The Antichrist system is a system of devils. They worship idols of gold. They worship idols of silver and of brass and of stone. This is our common day society. And of wood, people do worship their houses, they worship their cars, they worship their... A, a child will almost kill you over a cell phone. Children do kill themselves when their phones are breaking. It's a very sad thing. There's a suicide rate of children that will kill themselves when they don't have cell service. Is that not sad or what? Parents do likewise. They lose all hope when they can't provide their children with electronic devices based upon the demands of that child. The parent loses all hope. Now I ask you this. Or a person will also kill themselves if they have no gold or silver. I'm telling you right now, the world their life is based on the motivations given by what they have made themselves they worship the works of their own hands and you know what the Lord said don't worship anything but me didn't he you're not supposed to make yourself any engraven image or any likeness of anything above the earth and the earth or beneath the earth are you you're not supposed to worship these things you can be thankful for things but you can be thankful for tools I'm never thankful for a picture hanging on the wall because it can't do anything. A picture on the wall for me cannot do a thing. If it falls off and hits the floor, so be it. I need tools, not stuff. Do you see how society has changed? It used to be that blinds and curtains were to stop dust from coming through the cracks of the walls and blinds would keep the sun off of you, certainly in those hot places. You know what we have them for now? Pure decoration. Child comes up and touches the curtain, they get they get scorn. Why did you touch that curtain? I paid. See, when a person quotes and say, I paid a lot of money for this and that, what are they doing? Worshipping what they paid money for. So, listen, when you pay money for something, when you pay money for something, and you're proud of what you purchased and you won't let anybody touch it, here's what you've done. You've given that item your blood your sweat, your blood, your tears. And you now have placed it above all things in your household. Not even your children can touch it. No one can touch it. Because you have idolized it. You idolized it. And it's going to be the undoing. The eyes of the Lord are upon those with whom these things have been kept. Which makes me a very strange individual. Because people think I'm strange. I don't like money. I don't like stuff either. Things to me are tools. And guess what happens if your hammer breaks? You don't throw a conniption fit. Go 
they'll say, well, I can always get another hammer. Right? A tool is a tool. A tool is used to get the job done. Do you take care of your tools? Yes. Why do you take care of your tools? Not to worship them, but so that you can work with them. If you're building a house for a person, you want your tools in the best condition because now you're motivated to do it for somebody else. You'll do your best job for somebody else always. You will not do your best job for yourself, but in this society, people are trying to do the best job for themselves and not for the other person, and that is a mistake. That is perversion. Everything that you are should be utilized for somebody else. You should live your life for somebody else. Just like Jesus lived his life and gave his life for us. So should you. You should do the same. But that's not what we've been doing. And so now when we get into the book of Revelation and you see this big breakdown of stuff, that's what people are afraid of. Oh, I'm going to lose everything. They get frightened and scared. I want to know a date. I got to have a date. So I can have enough computer cords. I think it's funny sometimes. I'm not, I'm not laughing at anybody, but they say, well, if an EMP goes off, I need to put my phone in a Faraday cage. I guess they forgot that EMPs don't only go down, they go up too. So satellites are going to be the first to go. Isn't that funny? Listen, if the satellites are gone, you can forget cell phone service. You can forget your cell phone working. Can you imagine a person saving, listen, saving their remote control in a Faraday cage? But all the TVs in the world don't work. No digital devices work, but your remote control works. Now, what good did that do? That you saved a remote control, but there are no TVs. Now, wouldn't that be, that's kind of foolish, right? All that time, the energy and investment should have been Lord, teach me how to assist my brother and sister that their soul may be saved. Is that not eternal? And what I'm saying is this, before I, I really do have to go, is begin to do those things that are eternal. That's how you begin to prepare in truth. If it's not eternal, right? If it's not eternal, if it does not carry over in the kingdom, if it is not for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if it's not for that purpose, it's not going to do you any good. It won't do you any good. And it's all soon to come. So I give you one piece of advice as we continue to go on in these days. Begin to lift up one another. Folks, I am being secondary call here. But begin to assist one another. Winter is coming up. Let us all help everybody prepare for this winter. Let us all do so from the heart. And most of all, let your motivation be for the sake of somebody else. Mothers, let your motivation be your children. That's truly a lady of grace. Your ladies of grace. Grace, your ladies of grace. And you men out there are truly men of standards. You're going to hear me use that term a lot. Men of standards and ladies of grace. That's what's in the house of God. I don't know if Larry's on tonight, you all, but I'm going to leave the, uh, it will automatically switch to him at 9 o'clock. Now, Larry, if you come on sooner than that, if you so desire, everybody can go flood his mixler. And then if you desire to switch back over to Larry's Mixler is um, Larry, your Mixler, is it not on the home page of COT? I don't think so yet, right? Okay, folks, again, tomorrow's Wanky Wednesday. A part, a part of the subject matter of the B system is going to be talked about. It has to do with your credit cards, your banking habits, your Internet searches. What's driving people to do what they do and an addiction value due to frequencies. We're going to speak about that. I couldn't quite get into Revelation because this next study on Revelation, I might do that tomorrow night. It's going to be a long one, a long and thorough one. 
Because it won't be captured in short sentences and uh, precepts have to be captured. Now, hold on to your seatbelts and buckle your seatbelts. We're going to have some geopolitical problems this evening. Okay? We will have some geopolitical problems this evening. Don't try to interpret that. And concerning this hurricane coming up on the East Coast, those in Florida, those in Florida heed the warning. But listen, this storm will likely, there are two scenarios. It can dissipate all the way before it goes all the way up the East Coast, which means it's going to be a rain and a windmaker only. If, if, if a certain current penetrates past Cuba, it could actually strengthen as soon as it hits South Carolina. And so we're watching for that. That, that depends on the water current and this, the, the vortices and the air currents, the, the upper atmosphere air currents. So we're going to see how that looks and what takes place. If it picks up energy, that will certainly increase in magnitude after South Carolina. But heed the warnings in Florida and always do that. All right. Florida's a spot this. Um, actually, the water level's been rising in Florida for quite some time now. And it's only a matter of time, even without a hurricane, that Florida will eventually be underwater again. Because the earth, the, the, the pull on the equator of the earth is changing position, right? As this earth begins to tilt, so will the gravitational pull. The equator's bulge will begin to change. It's going to change water levels. You know at the equator, 300 feet of water is bulged out on the equator. I hope you know that. So if the gravitational pull changes by the Earth, tilting just a small degree, that 300, um, that 300 foot water bulge is also going to change. And when it changes, that means water levels all over the world could change up to 10 to 20 feet in any given direction. It depends on how the, how the Earth tilts. It can also cascade around the Earth. Uh, around the earth as the seasons change, which means the west coast could be underwater. We don't know. The east coast could be underwater two months later. So then the coastal cities are certainly going to be in danger after the earth tilts just a little bit more. And this is something also I'll be speaking about tomorrow because most people don't take this into consideration. It's something to watch for, but nothing to be nervous about. Don't ever become nervous about these things. Because if you do, you're forgetting who your father is in heaven. He is the one that permits or does not permit. Okay? I'm going to say God bless you guys. I really have to run. I do regret this. And yes, I didn't talk about everything tonight because I have to run. No need to get to a long conversation. I get myself in trouble not by not reporting into the place I need to report to. Okay? So God bless each and every one of you. Angela, I'll try to contact you. Uh, I, I may be able to, but it's going to be past uh, your time midnight. So... If you don't answer, I totally understand. should call people. My grandmother said, anything you have to do at night is normally wrong. That's what she said. Isn't that funny? I just thought I'd leave you with that. God bless you, Larry. It's good to see you in the chat room. If you feel like coming on, Larry, just come on and do your thing. But the timing is up to you. If you ever feel you, you can't uh, do the news but for so long, don't hesitate to say goodnight, everybody, and go off. Okay? But we do miss you. We're thankful that you're back thankful very thank you thank you pastor scott for today we love you larry pastor scott angela tatumator i'm not sure if tatum is going to be on tomorrow and angela tomorrow because angela comes on throughout the week so you guys check with pastor scott on that he's hooking, that'll be begotten sun ministries ring of fire cot and everything else but um she had a really good message last week i'm gonna say god bless you guys